There are beautiful things all around us all the time. Some are visible, but many are hidden. Most people never discover the hidden beauty in everyday life. This is primarily the fault of schools. Some teachers in schools systematically beat curiosity out of us. Many haven't figured out how to inspire and motivate us to find beauty on our own. In this video, I'm going to show you what you may have missed because Mrs. Crabtree assigned 50 long division problems instead of showing you something like this three-body orbital system, which apart from being beautiful, accurately represents real-world physics and teaches us how to visit distant planets. I was part of the last generation that had to learn long division to be regarded as educated. I would have loved to have learned about the three-body problem, about planetary orbits, about physics, but I hated long division. It made me think mathematics was a stupid activity for soulless drones. But that's false. Only long division is a stupid activity for soulless drones. Now I can write a long division function, as I've done countless times over my 50 years in computer programming, then move on to something more interesting, more beautiful. I don't know how math is being taught in schools today, but if math teachers aren't showing you something like this to inspire you, then you're being cheated. Before we get started, I have a funny story about public math ignorance. In this true story, a hamburger vendor decided to compete with the well-known McDonald's Quarter Pounder. The vendor announced a new Third Pounder hamburger, that's Third Pounder, for the same price as McDonald's Quarter Pounder. But the vendor's Third Pounder campaign mysteriously failed to attract anyone. The vendor did some research, and guess what? It failed because people thought the third pounder was smaller than the quarter pounder. That's smaller, not bigger. And why? Because four is bigger than three. Therefore, one quarter must be bigger than one third. I wish I was making this up. Anyway, let's get started. In this section, my plan is to show some examples of beauty starting with obvious examples and moving into sources of beauty that are less well known. Here's my favorite picture of Natalie Portman when she was young and perhaps untouched by experience. Most pictures of actresses make them look bulletproof, immune to raw experience. Well, not this one. If you see just one Natalie Portman film, let it be Leon the Professional, filmed in 1994 when Portman was 13, also starring Jean Reno as a professional killer. It's much better than it might sound. Here's Chloe Grace Moretz. I hope I'm not butchering her name. As with Natalie Portman, I have a favorite Grace Moretz film, which is Let Me In, the 2010 English version of a 2008 Swedish film titled Let the Right One In. She plays a vampire, a very nice vampire. My second favorite Moretz film is Hugo, a pretty amazing 2011 film directed by Martin Scorsese. Before we leave these examples of female beauty, I want to add a personal comment. Because of my age, I don't have something that young people might regard as an omission, but one I'm perfectly happy about. The topic is a bit delicate, so let me put it this way. When I visit the beach, I find myself mentally dressing people. To someone from my generation, calling literature beautiful might seem self-evident, scarcely worth saying. But now that print is dead, I think someone should say it out loud. When he was asleep, Mark Twain was still funnier and wiser than most wide-awake comedians of the present generation. I have a joke about the death of print. I visit a bookstore and I see a poster on the wall. It says, New Release! The Tragedy of Illiteracy! now available as an audiobook. This is my favorite math quotation. It summarizes what this video is about, the beauty hidden in mathematics. But I'm not just going to say it. I'm going to show it, with a mixture of mini tutorials and computer animations. Hey, don't be put off by these math symbols. They have an interesting story to tell. In this example, the uppercase sigma symbol makes a repeated sum of the expression to its right, 
with a provided number of repetitions. Don't be intimidated, it's just a repeated addition. See the symbol at the top of the sigma? Looks like a horizontal 8? That stands for infinity. In this example, it means to sum an infinite number of the expression to the right of sigma. As it turns out, if you take an infinite number of inverse powers of 2, 1 half plus 1 quarter plus 1 eighth, the result is 1. By the way, this is called an infinite series. The reason this series equals 1 is sort of, how shall I say it, beautiful. To show why, let's use a disk like a pizza to represent fractions. Here's the first term in the series, 1 half, shown as a half disk. Now we add one more term, so the pizza disk has an area of 1 half plus 1 quarter, or 3 quarters. Now we add an eighth, and the pizza is now 7 eighths complete. Now we add 1 sixteenth, so the pizza is 15 sixteenths complete. Now think about this. Each new term covers 1 half the remaining area. So how many terms are required to complete the disk? The answer is that an infinite number of progressively smaller pie slices are required to completely cover the disk. By the way, I posed this problem to the current large language model, which is GPT-4, and it was unable to figure it out. But it's understood that the current generation of large language models can't do math. They can describe the correct math procedure, but they fail to produce a useful result. This is a similar problem, another infinite series. This one proves that 0 0.999 indefinitely repeated equals 1. And for the same reason that an infinite series of progressively smaller pi slices equals a unit circle, meaning a circle of radius 1. This particular problem has caused a lot of online debate, mostly by people who don't actually understand the problem and its solution. When faced with an infinite series, someone is bound to say, correctly, that infinity is not a number, therefore you can't add up an infinite number of terms. But that's not how to think about an infinite series. It's more accurate to say that as you approach infinity, the result approaches 1. Or, to say it another way, the result is 1 in the limit. I've recently been studying the so-called three-body problem in orbital mechanics. It turns out that two orbiting bodies, stars, planets, whatever, are always stable and repeating, and a large number of orbiting bodies, like a stellar cluster or a galaxy, is similarly stable because the large number of bodies reduces the chaotic behavior one sees in a system with fewer bodies. But a system with exactly three bodies is a classic chaotic system. The term chaotic has a special meaning in this context. It refers to chaos theory. It means the system is very sensitive to initial conditions, and predicting the system's evolution is not practical without complete control over initial conditions. In these images, I make a tiny change in the initial velocity of one of the three bodies, in the ninth decimal place, as shown, and this adjustment completely changes the model's outcome. While I show this nice three-body animation again, I want to say there are ways to test a computer model's fidelity to nature. First, the system's total energy, the sum of kinetic and potential energy, should remain constant, consistent with conservation of energy. Second, the system's center of mass, shown here with a small gray cross, should not change position, consistent with conservation of momentum. When I design orbital models like this, I monitor the physical properties as the simulation proceeds, and if they drift away from the initial values, I know the model needs more work. Schrodinger's cat is a classic thought experiment that uses a simple idea to explain a property of quantum theory, one having to do with the theory's famous weirdness and counterintuitive outcomes. In the experiment, there's a sealed box containing a source of radiation, a Geiger counter, a poison vial, and a cat. The idea is that an atom in the radiation source will disintegrate, 
but with a timing determined by the rules of quantum theory. The atom will trigger the Geiger counter, which will break the poison vial and kill the cat. Because the timing of the atomic disintegration is determined by quantum probability, until there's an observation, the event doesn't happen in the everyday sense. Until observed, the atomic nucleus is in a superposition of states, neither intact nor disintegrated. And so, the cat is neither alive nor dead. As long as the box is open, the events are part of everyday reality. But if the box is closed, something very strange happens. Events in the box stop obeying normal physical rules. In particular, the cat enters a state of quantum superposition, neither alive nor dead. This quantum effect is being exploited in a new kind of computer, a quantum computer, which can get binary bits into a superposition of states which allows them to solve problems at a speed not possible with conventional computers. When you read about a connection between human consciousness and quantum theory, or on some spiritual quantum dimension, be on your guard. The people who write these articles often don't know what they're talking about. To see why these ideas have no merit, one need only think about the fact that the universe was humming along for billions of years before there were any people to observe it. So, people have no special role in quantum theory. Albert Einstein is described as the last classical physicist, the last scientist whose theories didn't take quantum effects into account. Interestingly, Einstein published thought experiments meant to disprove quantum ideas, but these efforts had the opposite effect. They ended up supporting quantum theory. Now for the relationship between large and small scales. This chart shows the rate of radioactive decay for a large radioactive sample consisting of billions of atoms, any of which might disintegrate over time. A large sample's activity rate can be reliably predicted over time because of the number of atoms involved, each of which is acting according to quantum rules. This is why quantum effect went unnoticed for so long. Large sample sizes appear to act classically. Notice about this chart that you can take any point as the starting point for a new half-life calculation. If you take year 2 as a half-life starting point, then year 3 shows half the activity of year 2, and so forth. When you think about this, you realize that the radioactive sample never becomes inactive, only less active, strictly following the half-life rule. So, because people would like eventually to reoccupy the territory around Fukushima in Japan, which is now too radioactive for safety, one need only apply the equation shown in this image to calculate when the excess radiation caused by the accident will fall below the radiation caused by natural sources like cosmic rays. This is in a class of questions that GPT-4 always gets wrong. At the time I write this, if you pose a question involving an infinite series, GPT-4 won't be able to give an accurate reply. It can fairly be said that GPT-4 doesn't understand infinity. In this chart, even though the curve is the same, we're once again in the quantum realm of individual radioactive isotopes. It says that, even though we can't say whether Schrodinger's cat is alive or dead at a given time, we can offer a probability of survival over time. This means the same half-life equation is used to offer a probability that the cat is alive at any time t, but with no certainty. This leads to an obvious question. If large-scale events can be reliably predicted, and small-scale events cannot be, where is the dividing line between the two realms? The answer is that there is no border between the large and small scales. As the number of atoms increases, our predictions become more reliable, but this doesn't mean quantum effects cease on a large scale. If this were not true, if there were some abrupt upper limit to quantum effects, our computers would stop working. Modern transistors rely on a number of quantum effects to function as they do, quantum tunneling in particular. This scale effect means transistors cannot be made much smaller than they are now, because if they were, they would stop behaving according to classical rules, and stored binary ones and zeros would switch states with no advance warning. As we make integrated circuit elements smaller and smaller, we're seeing signs of this approaching size horizon. 
A prime number is easy to describe. It's a number that can only be divided by itself and one. There was a time when prime numbers were an academic curiosity with no practical application. But that's no longer true. Prime numbers play an important part in computer security. You can multiply two prime numbers together in a flash, but getting the prime numbers back, an operation called factoring, is very difficult, and as the numbers become larger, it takes too long to be practical. Here's a simplified example of a secure computer transaction. Alice multiplies two large prime numbers together and creates a composite result. A so-called composite number is not itself prime, but is composed of primes. Alice posts the composite number online without any need for secrecy. Bob uses Alice's composite number to encrypt a message and posts the results online, also without any secrecy. Alice then uses her secret prime numbers, the prime numbers that created the public number, to decode Bob's secret message. Again, this is a simple description that only shows the broad outline of the process. The advantages of this method are that messages can be published without secrecy, and the participants don't have to meet in advance and exchange secret keys or passwords. The point I'm making is that prime numbers are very important to modern security, so we need to know as much as possible about how they work. If someone invented a way to quickly factor large composite numbers, reveal their prime factors, modern computer security would fall apart. Many people are working on this problem, if only to be sure that no such method exists. In this section, I ask that you simply follow the narrative thread. Don't expect to understand all the details. I ask this because the Riemann hypothesis is an interesting problem and, wait for it, no one understands all the details in spite of 160 years of research. We need some background. There's a hypothetical mathematical function called the prime counting function. We can describe it, say what it does, but to date we can't create it. The prime counting function tells us how many prime numbers exist at or below a given argument value. This graph shows how the prime counting function would behave if it existed. Each new prime number would increase the function's output by one. Before the advent of computers, mathematicians tried to find a function that would estimate the number of primes below a given value. These estimates were crude, but better than none at all. Now for the Riemann zeta function, which may eventually allow us to create a more meaningful prime counting function, as well as better understand prime numbers. I won't try to explain the details of the Riemann zeta function, except to say it shows a connection between a special set of numbers Riemann discovered in 1859 and the prime numbers. The special numbers are called the non-trivial zeros, and they're intimately connected to the prime numbers. One can use the Riemann zeta function and a computer to locate the special numbers and plot them on a graph. The Riemann zeta function identifies the locations of the special numbers by producing a result of exactly zero, hence their name. This is an obvious application for one of my computer programs, which sweeps across a range of numbers, detects the Riemann zeta zeros, and marks them on a chart. We know that Bernhard Riemann calculated the first few zeros using traditional methods, pencil and paper. I try to imagine how Riemann would react to seeing a modern computer create a few trillion zeros without any great effort. So what's the connection between the Riemann zeros and the prime numbers? This graph shows how they're related. The equation at the upper right uses a set of non-trivial zeros to locate the prime numbers, which appear as spectral lines. Because of my engineering background, this graph looks very familiar to me. It resembles a chart of amplitude plotted against frequency, with the prime numbers appearing as though they're distant radio stations being detected by a spectrum analyzer. Consistent with the notion of spectral analysis, here's a plot of the inverse spectrum, one that uses prime numbers to detect the Riemann zeros, the opposite process. 
Even though my comparison with spectral analysis isn't literally true, we know there's a connection between the primes and the Riemann zeros, and it's a connection we don't yet understand. I recently created a computer model that uses the Riemann zeta zeros to imitate a prime counting function. The red background trace is an ideal representation of the prime counting function, present for comparison with my model's results, which appear in blue. A range of Riemann zeros from none to 300 is progressively applied to my model to show the effect this has on the result. My model automatically detects and labels the primes as they appear. In the second plot, a wider range of primes is plotted to see how robust my model is at locating and identifying primes on a larger scale. I emphasize this is recreational mathematics, not an effort to address or solve outstanding mathematical questions like the Riemann hypothesis. I'll leave that to younger people, and people with bigger computers. But all involved recognize the importance of this problem, such that the Clay Mathematics Institute will pay a million dollars to anyone able to answer a simple question. Do all the non-trivial zeros lie on the critical line shown here. A mathematically proven result, whether yes or no, would produce the award. Maybe someone watching this video will take on this problem. Someone much more mathematically skilled than I am. Someone who, like me, hates long division, but who knows how to use a computer as a research tool. Someone who wouldn't mind having an extra million dollars. I'd like to talk a bit about computer programming. All my recent computer projects, including this zero search animation, are written in a relatively new language called Rust. Rust, and languages like it, will replace older system programming languages like C and C++. In fact, some computer companies are quickly and aggressively replacing older code with Rust. The reason for the replacement is that Rust is not only faster and easier to use, it's memory safe by design. Microsoft estimates that 70% of Windows failures result from memory corruption and related errors. So Microsoft has begun to re rewrite Windows libraries in Rust, not an easy task, but a necessary one. Rust is being adopted among Linux kernel developers for the same reason. I recently compared a computation-intensive Rust animation project to one written in Python. The Python version was, wait for it, 125 times slower. A C++ version was only marginally slower, but software development in Rust is faster than for languages like C and C++ because typical development environments interact with the Rust compiler in real time, so as you type, you see errors and avenues for code improvement right away, before compiling. In the future, programmers will need to know Rust, or a language like Rust that has the same memory-safe design. So my advice to young programmers is simple. Learn Rust, or be left behind. Here's my model of a nuclear fission reactor going out of control. I created it for a recent physics talk that needed some visual aids. I wrote the first version in Python, but when I got to the part where each neutron, that's the green particles, were independently tested for a collision with any uranium nucleus for each model time step, the algorithm slowed to a crawl. So I rewrote the model in Rust, which greatly improved things. Then I used Rust's easy-to-use multiprocessing features to put each neutron on a separate execution thread. 
My computer suddenly had to work for a living. My point is that Rust isn't just for system programming, the reason it was originally created. It's also a good solution for projects that require rapid turnaround and interaction, projects where Python was once the only meaningful choice. Well, I guess that wraps things up. Thanks for dropping by. Please like and subscribe so other people have a chance to discover beautiful mathematics. <laughs>